But let me begin by saying it's always a joy to be here, and I appreciate deeply the invitation to be a part of this great endeavor to teach the truth, defend the faith, and expose error, and to exalt those who love the truth and live by it. That, of course, happens because the eldership here is what they are. And I cannot commend them enough for their individual lives before God, of remaining qualified to serve as elders, and to do the actual work of an eldership. I must say, and I would be remiss if I didn't, to express my appreciation to them again, and especially to Michael and Karen for allowing me to be with them as I have for so many times over the years. It's always a joy for Michael to come and be with us, and certainly all many of you, if not all of you, have been a part of our endeavor from time to time at spring in the annual Spring Church of Christ Continuing for the Faith Lectureship. We covet your prayers there and our work with the paper too. Of course, it's not produced by the church, but it is privately owned and put out, and we certainly hope that you'll see fit if you're not receiving it to do so. It's free if you receive it electronically. Uh, if you just will let us have your uh, email, then we'll be glad to put you on there. Or you can go to the site uh, and be able to enter it there. Uh, may I also say that with this lectureship in particular, I've been going to lectureships for well over 40 years, and they've done a great deal of good, most of them, for the cause of Christ, especially meeting the issues of the day. In the last few years, it seems that that's been toned down by some people who appear to be, by their fruits, somewhat afraid to stand much of anything if it means losing friendship, money, and support. Well, they have their reward. And so it is that uh, this is not the case with this lectureship, and especially this topic. I would recommend that any young preacher need this book, and then to sit down and outline each one of them and make it their own. This particular topic in the general area of hermeneutics, uh, biblical interpretation, is very important in understanding how the Lord in His Word reveals the truth to us. I just haven't seen anything produced lately that is vital to the right division of the Word of God, the ascertaining of the truth that really is a help in our daily Bible study like this particular book. I know that if I were still directing a preacher training school, the students in one class somewhere would outline every one of these and there would be discussions about all of it and they would come out the better for it. So I urge you to be able to try to put these books in the hands of many young preachers as possible, of course, everybody. And those of uh, out there, as we used to say in TV land, now we say uh, in the uh, computer, wherever you are over the internet, uh, try to get a copy of this book and utilize it in your study of the Word of God to ascertain the will of God for your life and then teach and, and preach the truth. We are, and I want to say this before I get into the lesson, if elders are what God said elders ought to be, in meeting the qualifications, first of all, to be appointed as elders, and then once they're there, to truly, consistently, steadfastly do the very work ought to be done, they would know what shepherds of the flock really are. If they would look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, they would know what a shepherd would be. It's uh, one of those things that's not covered in this book too much, but uh, just the study of a shepherd would be one of those types to understand the work of the Lord himself and then the under-shepherds, the elders. The church would not be in the shape it is in today. Might be smaller in the sense that the people are not responding like they once did to the gospel. But the church would be pure today. It would not be fragmented as much if elders had faith in God to do what God said shepherds are to do. Amen. Elders must know each member of the church over which they've been appointed. They must understand what it is to shepherd each one of those sheep. I tell you, if they had a hundred head of cattle, they'd know something about them. And the fact it costs them roughly $2,000 a head, you talk money and people will begin to pay attention to it. But when it comes to souls that will exist in heaven or hell forever, and the charge God has given them, then they had better be mindful of being involved in the lives of the individual members 
so that they'll be able to guide and direct and lead them in pathways of righteousness for his name's sake to the glory of God. So many times it's, they stand off like a board on the 50th floor and issue orders and they don't really care to know much about people because don't get too close to them. To know a lot about people is to get involved in problems. But they must. Instead, what happens, something blows up and they become firemen, rushing in to rescue and uh, do all of that. No, if they would head off things, they could stop a lot of that. This congregation has elders like that. And I commend them highly. And this is part of their work for the good of this church and for the good of the brotherhood. Now to the lesson hand. Much has been already said regarding the matter of the scope of this uh, lectureship under the general heading of hermeneutics. And specifically of the matter of typology. So I'll not repeat those things. What I'll do is get directly into the cities of refuge. But let me pause here. I just had a thought that hasn't been done in all of the speaking about the West and son-in-laws and kids and daughters. As the old fellow said, they left out the mainest one. That's Sister Peggy West. Has anybody back there mentioned her? She may not want to be mentioned, but I'm mentioning her. She came uh, to live out there and to make sure that the general family was still living right not long ago. And she's with us today. The whole herd traveled over here. And uh, I'm glad to see them. We count them great in their involvement in the church at spring. And we love them for their work. But I didn't want Sister Peggy West to be left out because she sometimes cooks, and I'm afraid I'll miss some of it. <laughs> So to the ladies here, we congratulate them as others have done, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say that too. Now I'm going to skip what I said I would do relative to the cities of refuge, unless I have to call Terry down. And the law of Moses, we need to understand. The law of Moses provided the death penalty for the crime of murder. It's amazing how as a, as a theocracy, the law of Moses covered so much for the people of that time, God knowing ahead of time how long it would last, what it would do, the effect on them, et cetera, et cetera. But being a theocracy, then of course it handled things in the civil law, criminal law matter. So in Exodus 21, 12, it was the death penalty for the crime of murder. God never thought murder was a fine thing. Uh, we get all beside ourselves, and, and correctly so, over the 50 who, who were killed recently. But what about, as somebody said earlier, all of the millions of unborn innocent babies that are destroyed thousands every day? Nobody's too much concerned about that. I'll tell you one that's concerned about it. Jehovah God Almighty does not sit in the heavens like this. Not at all. Someday, he's going to decide, I'm going to remedy that, and who knows when that's going to happen, even before the final judgment at the end of the world. Now, it's interesting to note that though the law provided that death penalty, it also provided protection for those who accidentally killed someone or killed another in self-defense, chapter 21, verse 13. Let me read to you. It was actually given originally by God to uh, Moses, but then it was Joshua that placed all of it into effect in Joshua chapter, chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. Now the idea of a refuge is a wonderful thing. Have you ever sought refuge somewhere? Well, it means you're going to a place of safety usually, a place of comfort, a place of protection, uh, a place where you did not have to fear. Well, you think about this as it applied to the children of Israel and of the law of Moses and the provisions of that law. Uh, God therefore told Joshua to fulfill what he had commanded through Moses back over in Numbers chapter 35. Well, let me say further, the purpose of the cities of refuge for Israel under the law was then to protect the slayer who kills any person. What did he say? Actually, accidentally or unintentionally. Uh, the Hebrew word for this phrase is transliterated G-O-E-L, goel. And this context, it means the representative from the victim's family who is charged with making sure justice is carried out against the murderer of the family member. He's called the avenger of blood. He was to locate the murderer and if necessary, deliver him to the authorities for execution. Of course, 
this was provided that the testimony of two or more witnesses established the guilt of the one accused of the murder, Deuteronomy 17, 6 through 7. Now, it was possible and maybe highly probable that the avenger of blood could be seeking someone who was not guilty of premeditated, as we would say, cold-blooded murder, but who had killed accidentally or intentionally. And thus, God in his wisdom had uh, the cities of refuge established to protect that uh, innocent person. Joshua 20 and 4, and when, he had the, and when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering end of the gate of the city, and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them, and give him a place that he may dwell among them. So when someone is fleeing from the avenger of blood, when he came to that particular city of refuge, he stated his case to the elders at the city gates. You may say, why at the city gates? Well, anybody that's studying the Old Testament sees many times the elders at the city gates. That was the custom of the times that the elders spend time there uh, dealing with the accusations, pleas, disputes, and various kinds of advice that the people sought. And then they would give their sage advice and rendering verdicts, Proverbs 31, 23, and 2 Samuel 15, 2. And here we see that this was the place that the one who killed accidentally declared his case to the elders of the city of refuge where he had fled for protection from this avenger of blood. And following the fleeing man's explanation of the elders, then these elders of that city provided him this protection from the goel of the avenger of blood within the walls, within the walls, that's important, of the city of refuge, Joshua 20 verse 5. And there the man had to stay. He couldn't go outside. He had to stay behind those protective walls uh, to be protected from the avenger of blood. I have pointed this out, and I think it's good to be mindful. Sometimes we don't realize how just, right, and wise the law of Moses was as a civil and criminal law. But I pointed out here that uh, this arrangement helps reveal to us, really this was quite a sophisticated legal system. Uh, you had that the judgment is based on intent. The judgment is based upon premeditation of the accused. But the avenger of blood is to make sure that no murderer escapes justice. But God never has taken a kind view to murderers. So the law of Moses provided for the rights and protection of the accused, as well as providing a trial and a way for the murderer to be brought to justice or to protect the innocent from what he didn't deserve. Joshua 20 and verse 6, And he shall dwell in that city until the, uh, he stand before the congregation for judgment, and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days, then shall the slayer return and come into his own city, and unto his own house, and into the city from whence he fled. So the slayer seeking refuge in the city then, as I said earlier, had to remain behind those walls of the city of refuge to get the benefit of what the law said was his. And that's very important in the typology of this whole thing since we're talking about uh, the cities of refuge and there being types of the Lord's church and what can, we can learn about the church from those cities of refuge. Now, in view of the theme of this whole lectureship series and the topic about which we are specifically here in dealing, a correct typology um, is very important. And that means we must interpret it uh, correctly. So one of the ways the unity of the two testaments is upheld is by the prefigurations of the Christ and the typology that inspiration employed in prophesying of him. I wish I had time to go more into the unity of the Bible, and even this shows that the Old Testament, that is typology, so shows that the Old Testament is bound up as one unit with the New Testament. They just each have a role to fulfill. But they are a unit, and that's very important to understand. When we talk about an Old Testament, New Testament, we talk about testament or covenant, what it means. When we talk about the, the amount of books in each one, 39, 27, well, we're breaking it down in its component parts. But remember, God wrote the Bible. It didn't make any difference how long it took from man's perspective in time and space for him to produce it. The same Holy Spirit that inspired Moses inspired John when he wrote the book of Revelation. Time's nothing to him. God is not 
controlled by time. He, he spoke it into existence. He can work in it. He can work out of it. Someday he call it all to end. There won't be any time. There won't be anything that we know uh, right now that we can uh, examine with our five senses. So when he revealed his word, what was it to him that thousands of years went by? Nothing. They have no bearing on him. So God wrote the Bible. This is God's word. That needs to be kept in mind. Uh, no matter how he chose, such as typology or other ways, to give us his will. If we will learn those different ways, then all we're doing is coming at thing, the same thing in different directions to have a full explanation of the truth God says we need to know. And that Jesus said, if you continue in my word, wouldn't that be understanding the part that's had to do with typology? If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So we need to understand those particular things. Now, there were six cities of refuge in ancient Israel, located on the east of the Jordan River. The cities of refuge were Golan in the north, Ramoth in the center, and Bezer in the south. On the west side of the Jordan, there was Kadesh in the north, Shechem in the middle, and as they say today, Hebron, we say Hebron still, and well, we've always pronounced it, in the south. Joshua chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. Now, you've got to remember, we're not talking about the United States where you might have one city in Michigan and another one in California and another one in Virginia and one up in Maine and one down in Texas and one in Florida. You're talking about a geographic area that's about the size of New Jersey. So when you've got six cities that are spaced out as these were, then there's not anybody in all of Israel that's more than 30 miles from a city of refuge. It's available to them when they need it. Keep that in mind regarding the Lord's church. As, the, as is the case with numerous things, then as we've said earlier, starting back to the beginning of this uh, study, people, things, places, and events under the law of Moses, these are typical they are shadows of good things to come, according to the inspired writer of Hebrews, Hebrews 10 and verse 1. One of the things that impressed me a long time ago when I began to understand something about typology and the right division of the word and ascertaining the authority of my Lord for my life is that when you take the whole body of truth that is the law of Moses for the reason it was given to whom it was given, you realize everything in it, though you may not see it, and I might not see it, was a shadow of good things to come. And if the Jew had approached it, understanding what he was, why he existed as a nation, as a Jew, in the place of the law of Moses, and the worship under the law, the Levitical priesthood, the priests, and so forth, if he had understood this was all a temporary thing, that is, as Paul said, a law to bring them to Christ, then... Uh, how much better, how much more ready would they have been when Jesus Christ appeared on this earth? But they didn't. They, they didn't see it. They didn't understand it. But nevertheless, that doesn't change a thing. The law was a schoolmaster to bring, as Paul said, us unto Christ, Galatians 3.24. And thus typology figures in to the message of the law to bring us unto Christ. Now, we pointed out previously in studies and in this study as, as matters of the Old Testament and specifically from the law of Moses that there were types, there are anti-types, and they're found in the last will and testament of the Christ. And so it's so with the cities of refuge, keeping in mind the basic meaning of refuge, and we're talking about the Lord's church. These cities signify the very substance. Now, get this. The very substance, the very substance that is the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Prefigured so long ago. The Lord purchased, of course, that church, our, our refuge, with his own precious blood. That's why when you understand the cities of refuge that he adds everyone who flees to him for salvation and protection and refuge. He adds them every one to the great city of refuge, the church of the living God. People who hear the gospel honestly believe it and from the heart obey it. 
the Lord adds them to that great church. And all you have to do is look really at the very plan of salvation, the scriptures that point out what it is and teach us what that plan is to see how that it is done. So I'd like for us to consider the remainder of the time now the very meaning and the significance of the names of these cities of refuge. And notice how they help us, how they help us to appreciate the body of Christ to a greater degree. And one thing you will notice immediately is that the sad, terrible, blasphemous view of denominationalism is condemned in just understanding the cities of refuge and how they are typical of the Lord's church. First of all, there's Kadesh. It means separate, set apart, holy, meaning dedicated to a certain thing, in this case, dedicated to God. It carries with it the idea of sanctified. It typifies a marvelous characteristic of every member of the Church of Christ. By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle lets us know that the church is called out of darkness into light, 1 Peter 2, 9. Well, we're called by the great gospel call. That's the reason Jesus commissioned it, the apostles originally, and so the church to preach the gospel to every creature. Uh, they must hear the call. Thus, the call through the gospel. Thus, they must hear it. It's the charge of the church to do the preaching and the teaching and each member to set godly examples as they apply the truth of the gospel to their lives that they might be set apart, that they might be truly holy and meet suitable for the master's service. The Greek word ekklesia, translated church, means called out. Again, called out by the gospel. Notice that none of it has to do with just what God did, but it involves us. Uh, that is, God does the calling through the gospel, but we must do the learning of the gospel and the application of the gospel and to meet the demands of the gospel, the terms of pardon in the gospel. Uh, God just doesn't operate on his own to save us, and we have no part in it. That would go against the very way he made man as far as being intellectual and irrational, having a will and emotions and a conscience. We're designed uh, to be able to hear and understand or reject uh, you don't have to study your Bible. God's not going to come down right now and hit you with a bolt of lightning because you didn't study your Bible. We have that power given to us. It has to be that way. For how can we truly demonstrate that we love him and our faith in his system, as was uh, the message this morning by Brother Jerry, uh, which is a great lesson. That just needs to be studied. That was one of the richest things I ever had early on in my life is to realize the difference in moral law and positive law when it came to the revelation of God and what each one did. But we must realize then that that's just the way man is tested by God to say, will you love me? Will you obey me? Do I come first? Well, I've got to have a decision. Someone said God has cast a vote for us. The devil won against us. Guess who holds the deciding vote? I do. So Jesus informed his apostles that you're not of the world. Well, how do you mean that? They didn't live the way the world lived. They lived the way the Lord told them to live. That's all that means. You're out of the world in that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life governs you and takes up your time. You set your affections on things above. That is, you're interested in the will of God. You're interested in doing what you're supposed to do here to get ready for heaven. You're just pilgrims and strangers passing through this land, using it for what God intended, and that is go to heaven. So you must be separate from the world. And it's the Apostle John who wrote, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, he wrote this to Christians, folks, not to those outside the church, although it certainly refers to them. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 15 through 16. You know, Paul said, examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith. How do you do that? Well, you've got to know the Bible. But here's one way. If you have more time spent in gratifying the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you don't love the Father. It's just that simple. If those things take precedent over your study and obedience to the Word of God and being faithful in the church, you don't love the Father. You may say you do, but I know better. How do I know better? God gave me a measuring stick. Now, I know that about me. That's how I can know whether I'm growing and developing things I need to correct, things I need to do better. And that's all involved in, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Paul declared that God had delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us 
into the kingdom of God's dear son, Colossians 1.13. And that great apostle wrote the church at Corinth, addressing them as the church of God, which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, 2. Wherever you are, whatever that congregation is, it's the church of God, which is wherever it is. And that means we've got to be sanctified. We must be holy. We must be children of light. We must be sounding out the truth and defending the faith. I regret greatly sometimes that the church has chosen just to, you know, employ a preacher and he works for that congregation. Well, that's scriptural. It's authorized. Nothing more wrong with that. And yet what happens is an abuse of it. The preacher becomes about the only one that's supposed to stand up and fight. Everybody else assembles and studies, if you can get them to do that, and they go on about their business. Well, preacher, you do this. Preacher, you do that. Folks, in one way or the other, to one extent or the other, according to our roles as men and women in the church, we're all teachers of the truth. We're all expected to stand up for the truth. On the job, in school, somebody may say something that's wrong. Well, what are you going to do about it? Go run off and stick your head in the corner? Or should you stand up and be counted? Yes, we, you'll be surprised. We talk about getting people's attention, that there's a difference in the way Christians live and uh, the way the world is. When you hear somebody use foul language, when you hear somebody tell a dirty joke, when you hear somebody do something, or not do something as the case may be, do you speak up about it? Or you just kind of make sure you get away so you won't be called on. I remember being in college in the state school, and I'm young in the faith, wanting to preach. And the fellow they stuck me with the room was uh, room with was considerably older than I at the time. I think I was 17 in my freshman year of college. He was on up in his 20s, which at that stage, you know, he might as well be as old as Jerry in the separation <laughs> between them. And uh, he had been a sailor, and you can imagine the old saying, cuss like a sailor. Well, that's what he could do. He had the bad habit of using my Lord's, in my Lord's name in vain, the typical way it's always been done. And I just got tired of it pretty quick. And I didn't act ugly or anything. I just said, you're using my Lord's name in vain. I don't like it. Now, could you please have enough respect for me as your roommate not to do that? Well, he, I think it took him back so much he didn't know what to do. And I said, now, if you keep on doing that, I'm going somewhere else. Well, he kept on doing it on down the road. And I came one day, and he got mad. Something happened in the English class. And, man, he was letting it have it. I said, does it. Goodbye. And uh, I think that, well, do we do that, brethren? Let me ask you something. Would you give up your job making your money if you stood up for the truth in order to do it? I don't think many people think that way. In fact, most of the time they're telling their kids, go to college, get a good education, become this, become that, so you can have a good uh, job in life. You don't say much about it. But we're to be different. We're to be separate. Not different for the sake of difference, but different because we live like the Bible says if you do. And we teach the truth. We speak up. So that's the significance of Kadesh. The church must be that way to be a true city of refuge. A place where the Lord adds his people to the church. They're holy. They're sanctified. They're set apart. They're a light to the world, not a part of it. And that's so important. My brethren have learned that. As Paul wrote to the Corinthian brethren, come out from among them and be, that's something I must do, be ye separate. Well, I have to know what the, what the Bible teaches about what that means to be separate. I don't live like the world. I don't talk like the world. And, you know, in time you'll get to where you just don't enjoy the world. You start thinking about that other place, that eternal home. And don't you think God intended that to happen? For he certainly says a lot about the hope. In Romans 8, 24, he says we're saved by hope. Well, if you don't ever dwell on where you're going to be for eternity, how can you have much hope that works very well for you at all? Well, then we have another one called Shechem. Shechem means shoulder or support. And thus typifies a different characteristic of the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Paul penned to Timothy that the house or family of God is the church of the living God. The pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Now get this, please. I emphasize it. The church of our Lord is primarily and fundamentally a teaching institution. Now if you listen to some of our uh, well-oiled brethren, whatever that means, um, they kind of think it ought to be all things to all men. Some sort of uh, glorified salvation army. 
We used to sing a song we didn't know any better, Salvation Army, Salvation Army, put a nickel in the drum, save another drunken bum. Uh, that's the social gospel stuff that says if you help the flesh, that's really all you're here to do. Well, granted, there's a benevolent attitude, and we see it in Christ, and it's commanded in the church. But it never was meant to be the end within itself. It was meant to demonstrate the love and concern and the milk of human kindness of people in the church who were godly and considered the sad state other people were in and more or less has the attitude of there but for the grace of Almighty God go I and I will do what I can to help people but it's to try to demonstrate the love the church has to cause them to focus in on the gospel that saves them eternally. It doesn't begin and end with a pot of beans. As such, then, the church not only teaches the truth and this bothers me here, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, but defends all of it as well. Ephesians 3.10, Philippians 1.16, and Jude 3. One of the sad things about our Lord's church today is that people say, well, I never hear anything wrong coming from the pulpit, but do you hear everything you should hear coming from the pulpit? Well, I, I, I don't know what we all, what we do. I don't know what all we support. But you have to have Bible authority, Colossians 3.17, for all you do. That means a church must support only those who themselves are faithful. How do you know where the money goes? Well, it's sort of like we have church of Christ above the door. We go through the motions of having a proper worship period. And then who knows what happens as to where the money goes out of the treasury to who? Well... We helped this group. But that group a long time ago been to, began to espouse false doctrine and associate with no telling who. And fellowship, we'll have more about fellowship in a little bit, do this. And we continue to funnel the money to them. Oh, but we, we preach the truth. We have the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week. We sing without a mechanical instrument, etc. Oh, well, fine. How does that give you license to ignore the rest of it? It's the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's Bible. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, I'm not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. American Standard says the whole counsel of God. By what right do I have to leave any of it out? Uh, can we go to heaven on 99.99% of the gospel of Christ? I think some people think, well, you know, the idea is really like meritorious work. <coughs> Uh, the scale of justice is way down over here because that's where I do most of what's right. It just outweighs a little bit of wrong I do. <laughs> well, don't expect to hear well done, good and faithful servant when you stand before the Lord in judgment because you won't. If you're not covered by the blood of Christ and only those faithful to God in all things will be covered by the blood of Christ, then you're going to hear depart from me. I never knew you. Into everlasting fires prepared for the devil and his angels. We must be in the grace of God, and that takes adherence to the authority of Christ and the whole doctrine of Christ. So this shoulder, this support, am I by my life, by my mind, by my works, by my talents, by my money, am I supporting the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Opposition to the truth is constant and on every hand. It always will be. The devil will see to that because without the truth, nobody's saved. If he can corrupt it, then he's got everybody. It comes from false teachers, yes, within the church. Have you ever noticed how over the years that people will talk about all these false teachers that are mentioned in the Bible and how terrible it is, but they seemingly can never find a false teacher around us? They, you start pointing out, brother so-and-so, and here's what he teaches, and we can document it. And they say, well, he married my mom and daddy, and I grew up with him eating turkey, that might say something. Eating turkey at the, at the table, and he's so kind, and he smells good, and he's been with whatever so long, and he's been so kind to me, and I'm remembering from when I was at my mother's knee. Fine. The devil's used him to lead you to hell. We just don't think that way. And that's why we're so close to denominationalism even in the church. Folks, we oppose the denominationalism of Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, etc. But within the church of our Lord, we practice denominationalism. You know, if this one just doesn't do much over here. We can continue to associate with him. Well, this one over here teaches a doctrine that's contrary to the truth. I've told him about it, but the next lectureship, we're going to be on there with him. And we just don't make any distinctions at all. Like, if we're in the church, we'll be. We can just do about what everybody else does in the denominational world. As long as it's between us, it's all in the family. So we can't allow that kind of thing to go on in the shoulder or the support. 
or this uh, shechem that represents the church. So the church is to face all those who attempt to corrupt the truth with worldly wisdom of whatever kind it may be, concerning God, Christ, the Holy Spirit, the Bible, the gospel, and everything concerning the Lord's church. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, the verses following, Hebrews 4, 2. And that's where, as I said in the beginning part, the elders have a great deal to say in this matter and to keep the church what it ought to be. There's then Hebron, alliance or fellowship, the fellowship of the church as taught in the New Testament cannot exist without concern for doctrine. It's not by accident that people are making light of doctrine that has nothing to do with our fellowship one with another. It does. It very much does. You cannot have the fellowship God wants you to have unless you know how to ascertain Bible authority, unless you're willing to abide by all of the obligatory matters God plays upon the church. Those things that have to do with going to heaven. To oppose the doctrine of Christ is to oppose the fellowship that Christ's doctrine brings into being and sustains when people are obedient to the gospel and continue in its guiding precepts and living the Christian life. Romans 1, 16 and every other passage that connects with that. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son Jesus Christ our Lord. Of his fellowship we find that the saints are expected to walk in the light as he is in the light, having fellowship one with another. I want to mention something about this in the short time remaining. Years ago, when we were at Tulsa, there was a situation there. Uh, Marvin Phillips was there, and he was advocating all sorts and sizes of stuff. And we were in a preacher's meeting one day, and he was advocating his fellowship with the Christian church and all this kind of stuff. And I asked him a question. And I referred to 1 John 1, 7. I said, John wrote this, and we know it applies to Christians and their conduct. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. I said, what's the meaning of that passage? It's written to Christians. We must have to understand it. It helps me be faithful. We all know that. I said, did you ever think of this? Acts 2 and verse 42. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. Let me ask you this. Can you conceive of somebody walking in the light as he is in the light and not continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine? Or can you conceive of somebody continuing steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and not walking in the light as he is in the light? One is a divine commentary on the meaning of the other. You cannot walk in the light, the light of truth, that brings about fellowship and allows the cleansing power of the blood to cleanse us, always the blood we contacted in the waters of baptism that cleanse us from our past and alien sins. You can't do that without abiding in the doctrine of Christ. You can't abide in the doctrine of Christ without walking in the light. They're the same thing. And that means doctrine comes first before fellowship. Amen. And that doesn't seem too hard to understand. Of course, you have 2 John 8 through 11. But let me quickly move on by summarizing that point that clearly it's the case that impure doctrine will destroy the fellowship between the church and God and the fellowship between the faithful and the unfaithful. Bezer means enclosure or fortress. The church is to be a fortress against which the devil cannot become the defenders of it. And doctrine must be there. Right doctrine must be imbibed by every member of the church. In Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Ephesians 6.10, again. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. This is a reality to every member of the Lord's church. Said, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So every child of God is to properly use the word of God, Ephesians, uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Moving on to Ramoth, it means elevation or high place. Oh, what does that say about the church? The bride of Christ, the only institution on earth that contains all the saved. Expected to shed forth the light of the gospel, the whole gospel, defend the faith where the members are to be holy, to be a shoulder and support of the truth. It's the high and holy hill of Psalm 2, 6 and 15, 1. It holds a lofty place in the divine scheme of things. Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it, Ephesians 5, 25. Now in giving himself to or for the church, Christ shed his own blood. There's the purchase price to bring the church in existence, Acts 20 and 28. Surely it's worth the purchase price. Jesus Christ 
and the church are one. To denigrate and put down one is to denigrate and put down the other. Ephesians 5.31 The church is the spiritual body of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.22 and 23 To make light, to speak against the importance of the Lord's church is to make light and speak against the price paid for it and he who paid the price. The church is God's family. 1, 3, uh, 1 Timothy 3.15 Now, unlike some adulterous men, God has children born only into his family. So when people say, oh, there's members of the church and all the churches, they don't realize the charge they're laying against our God. We need to tell them that in the church as we preach the gospel and oppose the devil's organization of denominationalism. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, 1 John 3, 1. And then we look to Golan, meaning circular passage. The church of Christ needs no adjunct organization. It is, as the Bible presents it, perfectly capable of doing all God expected it to do. It is complete to accomplish what God intended for her to do. Of the church, the great apostle Paul wrote to the Colossians saying, and he is the head of the body, the church. Who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. Colossians 1, 18 through 20. Read that and understand it and then say the church doesn't make any difference. Just is sad. So the church then is a complete passage because in it we are reconciled to God in one body through the cross, Ephesians 2, 15. And our Lord then taught, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it, Matthew 7, 13 through 14. Look at that word in the King James Version, S-T-R-A-I-T. You don't see it spelled that way today, but back in the days of Elizabethan English, uh, straight means a narrow hemmed in passage. In the case of the passage from earth to heaven via the church, it's a restricted, hemmed in on all sides by the commandments of the Lord. And you can't just nonchalantly enter it. You must be willing to divest yourself of anything that will not let you enter that hemmed in passage. You must give your whole self to God and give up anything and all things that hinder you from rendering obedience to all things God requires. Let me say this in closing. You can't accidentally go to heaven. You will not accidentally go to heaven. You will go to heaven when you determine with all the power of determination you have to go to heaven and you know it's the Lord's way and you're going to submit to it from the heart. You can't carelessly enter that passage bearing the various burdens of sin. The burdens of sin will not permit one to enter in. A person must be freed from sin to fit into the passage that leads to heaven. Thus one must obey the gospel of Jesus Christ to be able to enter and travel the straight and narrow way, which is the only way to heaven. Now in seeing the church as the antitype of the cities of refuge, we have a marvelous and wonderful picture painted by inspiration of the church that upholds that church that came from the mind of God and all of his wisdom. That place that was holy and set apart from the ways of the world, a place of spiritual support where men are once again in fellowship with God and all of those who are in fellowship with God. A fortress protecting the children of God that is God's high and exalted place of refuge for those who have fled to Jesus for safety. It is the only complete passage for mankind that leads from earth to heaven. In closing, it's my hope, it's my prayer, it's my earnest life work that at least now in this study, that our love for the Lord's church will increase because of the typology found in the, city of ref the cities of refuge. That we'll magnify the church that appears on the pages of the Bible and realize that it is the church all bind for Jesus Christ of Nazareth to the glory of God the Father 
and the salvation of the souls of men to which we have dedicated our lives and we do not take it lightly and we shall spend our life's blood in proclaiming the gospel that proclaims the church of our Lord without shame and that we will defend her to the best of our ability till we can do no more in this life. And then I'm going to lay my armor down and I'm going to go to heaven. I want as many to go with me as I can. And everybody can have that hope if they but will. Whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. Thank you. We appreciate that, David. And as he was mentioning, the church is a teaching university teaching organization that's primarily what it is I think so many brethren today believe that don't believe that they believe it's an emotional uplifting organization that's to make me feel good uh, and then preachers uh, don't do the proper instruction They'll teach what they want to teach that won't get them in trouble and get them fired and leave the rest alone. And they know what those subjects are and they shy away from them. And then they'll go and buddy-buddy with anyone and everyone as they fellowship those who they should not be. Even though they might not agree with them, it doesn't make any difference.